It's a great Sunday to begin the sermon with a reminder of your baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, listen once again to God's anointing of King David, 1 Samuel chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. This is the word of our Lord. To brothers and sisters, Samuel wasn't the prophet and leader of God's people for the paycheck. This was Samuel's life. Ever since his mother weaned him and dropped him off at the temple, to, at the tabernacle to minister before the Lord. Oh, and then it was his life even more so since that, since that night early on when, when God called to him by name, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Over the next decades, God spoke an awful lot to Samuel, and, and Samuel did a whole lot of listening. This wasn't about a paycheck for him. This was his life. It was his calling. He was fully invested. And, and as a result, Samuel suffered a whole lot of heartache. I think you know what it's like when, when you pour out your heart into something and your hopes are high, only to see it all crashing down. That happened to Samuel after his hair had turned gray and the Israelites started, to thinking, started thinking about their next chapter as a nation. They, they wanted something flashier than Samuel and God. They wanted a king like all the other nations had. That was the first big punch in the gut for Samuel. But, oh well, that's what the people wanted. Go ahead, God told Samuel. Give him a king. It's what they want. They'll learn soon enough that, that the, the glamour of royalty comes at a high price. And remember Israel's first king, Saul. When, when Samuel first 
poured the oil on Saul's head and set him apart as God's chosen, anointed king, it, it seems like a glimmer of hope came back into Samuel's heart for the nation of Israel. Because Saul, he, he looked the part. He was, he was handsome. He stood a, a head higher than his peers. And, and even more promising than that, Saul, he wasn't chasing after the kingship. He was, he was way more timid than he was presumptuous. He, he trembled at the thought of occupying such a high office. And, and isn't an ounce of humility a good sign? But if you know your history, that humility didn't last long. And, well, Saul, he... He pushed God off of his throne, had a good start, but soon enough, he pushed God off of his throne, and Saul carried on as if the weight of the nation was on his shoulders, not God's. And that was the, that was the second big punch in the gut for Samuel. Samuel had rejected the Lord as his God, and so God rejected Saul as his king. And Samuel, Samuel was the one to break the news. That's the scene that comes right before these verses here. That's the scene in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. If, if you read it, it's raw with emotion. You have Samuel saying to Saul, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. And Saul he begs and pleads with Samuel. When I read it, I picture Samuel or Saul down on his knees in tears, pleading with Samuel, and none of this brings any joy to Samuel. Samuel's choking back the tears himself as he turns his back on Saul and walks away from him for the last time. If, if our founding fathers, imagine if after the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War and the Constitutional Convention, if after that, that, that long and tumultuous and expensive experiment in democracy, imagine if, if George Washington turned out to be a failure as a president and the United States collapsed and democracy became a laughingstock to the world, how would they feel? Well, that's Samuel in verse 1 when the Lord comes to him and says, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? I see irony between the lines here. Saul's great downfall is that he had pushed God off of his throne and carried on as if the weight of the kingdom was on his shoulders, not God's. And now Samuel, Samuel's looking at it the exact same way. As if, as if everything hinged on Saul. In Samuel's eyes, with Saul out of the picture, there, there was no more hope for Israel. When, when God comes to, to Samuel here, I... I in, in verse 1, I, I picture it like Samuel is still in bed or at least on the couch in his pajamas at 1 o'clock in the afternoon because, because those are the spaces where people tend to linger when they're hopeless. And, and I picture God uh, saying the same thing to Samuel as he said to him in bed the last time. Samuel, Samuel, ha have you forgotten about me? I'm still on my throne. But, but Samuel's not finished pouting. God tells him to go to Bethlehem. I have a plan. Go to Bethlehem and go to Jesse's house. I've, I've chosen to anoint, uh, for you to anoint one of his sons to be king. But I think... You know what it's like to be in Samuel's shoes when, well, when it wasn't his, his finest day. Samuel was, was a faithful man of God, a giant compared to any one of us. But this isn't exactly when he's shining his brightest. 
If you know what it's like when you've been punched in the gut one too many times and you're just deflated and you're stubbornly hopeless and you don't want to hear any different from anyone else, even if the Lord were to call you by name and say, have you forgotten me? But yeah, Samuel's not done pouting yet. How can I go to Bethlehem? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. In case you've forgotten, God, I just told, I just told the king that you've rejected him and are going to put somebody else on the throne. Do you really think that he's not going to come after me? And to go to Bethlehem, I'm going to have to walk right past Saul's camp. But it wasn't that God had forgotten it's that Samuel wasn't seeing things clearly. Samuel had put all of his hope in a failure, and he didn't see any way out of it. Un until, until he goes to Jesse's house, and then Jesse calls out his boys, and Samuel sees the next king of Israel standing before the Lord. God had instructed Samuel, you are to anoint for me the one I indicate. But then when Eliab comes out and stands before Samuel, Samuel doesn't need the Lord to speak another word. It's so obvious. Uh, you can imagine him twisting the cork off of his horn of oil to anoint Eliab. And God's like, nope. Twist it back on. He's not the one. I've rejected him. And if Samuel had seen any glimmer of hope in his heart when he saw Eliab, it's dashed again. And then, well, maybe it's Abinadab. But the Lord has not chosen this one. Maybe it's Shammah. But the Lord has not chosen this one. Samuel's got to be scratching his head. The Lord said, I've chosen one of Jesse's sons, but finally Jesse has run out of sons. The Lord has not chosen any of these. Jesse, do you have any other boys? Well, the sheep can't watch themselves. Some of us know what, what it's like to be picked last for the team. David didn't even get invited to play. Anyone who's ever been in a children's Christmas service knows that Bethlehem Ephrathah is small among the clans of Judah, which means that David was considered insignificant by the insignificant. But Samuel, now it's time to untwist that cork off your horn. This is the one. Anoint him. David was God's anointed one. To give that a bit more of a Hebrew flavor, David was the Lord's Messiah. Messiah is Hebrew for the chosen one, the anointed one. Or, or to give it a bit of a more Greek flavor, David was the Lord's Christ. Christ is Greek for the chosen one, the anointed one. We live in a, a world of applications and interviews and tryouts. If, if you want the position, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to be smart enough. You've got to be strong enough. You have to have the, the connections and the track record, maybe even come from the right stock. Came across a study. It showed that the, the, the most powerful CEOs are way above average in height. But the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. The Lord can look straight through a person. He knows what we're made of, and he knows who's right for what. 
but that, that doesn't mean either. And, and this is super important. That doesn't mean either that God's selection of Israel's greatest king was the inevitable result of God omnisciently scanning the hearts of every potential candidate and the youngest son of Jesse just happened to get the highest score on God's decision matrix, so he was God's best bet to lead Israel. God's anointing of David. It, it wasn't just God's way of saying, congratulations, you're the top candidate, you got the job. No, that anointing did something. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. The Spirit of the God who chose David to be king, also equipped David with everything he needed to do the job. It's, it's not so much that God picked David because, because David was the best candidate for king as much as it was that David was the best candidate for king because God anointed him. He was the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ. But if you know your history, you know that David was far, far from a perfect king. Bathsheba the cover-up that cost her cheated-on husband his life. A punch in the gut to anyone who had put their faith in David. But we heard about another anointing today. Did you catch whose? Lots of parallels. The people who were gathered at the Jordan River, they were looking at John the Baptist, uh, not so much differently uh, from how Samuel was, was, was looking at, at Eliab, wondering in their hearts if, if John might possibly be the Messiah. Jesus wasn't even on their radar. But the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. And good thing, because we never would have known the Lord's Messiah if God hadn't revealed him to us. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Not only was it that, that Jesus was the only one up for the job, but it's also that God poured out his spirit on Jesus and equipped him with everything that he needed to carry it through to his cross and to his grave and, and to his throne where he rules over all. Messiah with, with a capital M, Christ with a capital C. And then we heard about another anointing today. Did you catch whose? Yours. God poured out his spirit on you. Not because of righteous things you had done, but because the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared at your baptism, God anointed you. He declared you to be something that you might not see when you look in the mirror. His child, whom he loves, with whom he is well pleased, his heir of eternal life, everything that Jesus did for you. God chose to give to you. And God will stand behind his choice. 
no matter what appearances may be. When you feel like Samuel, and, and you know that your life isn't punching in and out on Sunday mornings, your life as God's child is your calling. It's your identity. You're invested But then when it comes to how many punches in the stomach and you're deflated, what do you do? How about this? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And what does he say? I haven't forgotten about you. I'm still on my throne. And you're still baptized. No matter how guilty you feel, your sins are forgiven. No matter how inept you feel how insufficient to carry out the calling that God has given you. Well, it's not just a job that God has given you. God poured out his spirit on you, and his spirit will continue to equip you with everything you need to do it. And even when you fall short in your weakness, God will more than make up the difference. You're not putting your faith in a Saul or even a David or a failure. Your faith is in the Lord's Christ with a capital C, this Messiah with a capital M, and you're baptized. And the Lord will stand behind his choice. Amen.